Thank you. Do you see it now? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, these are the four major categories of tenses, and you have uh, the past, the present, and the future. So let's take a very simple verb. Uh, let's just take the word eat and convert them into these 12 tenses. So past simple would be simply uh, I ate or we ate, he ate, she ate. Present simple would be I eat. If it's uh, plural, if it's singular, uh, for example, he or she, you can use the word eats. Otherwise they eat, uh, we eat, um, we all eat. So you have these forms of eat and eats. And finally, future, it's going to use the word will. So I will eat, they will eat, he will eat, she will eat. Now progressive, in the past, you either use was or were. So I was eating, he or she was eating, they were eating. And just be careful about I, because I doesn't follow a whole lot of rules, as you can see over here. In the present simple, I is following the rule that's meant for all the plural nouns. But over here in the progressive past, I is following the rules meant for all the singular pronouns. So you need to be a little careful with I. Progressive present will simply be I am eating. So here I am eating is unique to I. Uh, otherwise you usually use words like is eating or are eating. And in the future, again, all you need to do is simply add the will. Will be eating. And that applies to all, singular or plural. I will be eating, they will be eating, she will be eating. Now, perfect tense is the one that's most important. And perfect progressive is also important. But the thing is that in GMAT, we usually don't reach. Uh, the perfect progressive tense because it's not concise at all and usually there is a much more uh, concise way of saying the same thing so perfect progressive tense is usually not uh, there in the right answer so perfect tense past i had eaten and uh, that applies to all uh, i had eaten she had eaten they had eaten so regardless of the number of the noun or the pronoun, you have to use had. For present, I have eaten, they have eaten, he or she has eaten. So you need to be careful about has versus have. And in the future, again, you just need to add will and uh, be. I will have eaten. And that applies to all, singular or plural. And after doing these 12 tenses, we will be looking at the cases in which you have to use the perfect tense. Because again, the perfect tense is adding an extra word. We don't use it all the time, except when needed. So we'll discuss those uh, couple of cases next. And perfect progressive would be, I had been eating. So that's the longest one. She had been eating, they had been eating. For present, it's going to be, I have been eating. And she or he has been eating. And finally, for the future, the future will become a little complicated with a lot of words. I will have been eating. She will have been eat eating, they will have been eating. So as you can see, it doesn't um, like flow quite easily. So this is something that is usually avoided, the perfect progressive tense. So this is avoided, this is used only in specific cases and if you do get a choice between the simple and the progressive always choose the simple one so this is the best one to use but in some cases you can use the perfect tense as well 
So do you have any questions about these 12 tenses? No, all good. No, okay. No. Lakshmi, is it fine? Yeah, where, where does that thing come? If I were, I would have, does, does it belong to any of in this, this table anywhere? So usually, uh, so that is like an exception. Usually what we do is we use was with I. Uh, but what happens is if you have hypothetical situations and if you add the word if before it, then you use were. This is something that is also covered in the subject verb agreement errors in hypothetical situations. For example, if you were my friend, I would have done this for you. Uh, those kinds of situations. But we'll be covering them once again in verbs. So I'll be talking about it next. Okay, sure. Okay. So again, the most important one of these is the perfect tense. So you should know when to use it and when not to use it. So this is the first rule. You have to use it only in these two conditions. One is when in the meaning of the sentence, you have a good idea about the time. So if these words are being used, these four words or anything else that you may get new in the test, but it's giving you an idea of the time in which an action took place. So for example, uh, I have been studying for 10 years. So in this case, I'm using the ing because that studying is still going on. And I'm using have been because it's an action that is still taking part for these 10 years. But if I add something like last 10 years, and I want to say that the action has ended now, I'll simply just change the have to had. I had been studying for the last 10 years. So let me take another example. Uh, let's say I'm talking about the future. I will have given the test. So if I just write this sentence, it's going to be wrong because you're using the perfect tense just like that. You don't have any idea of the time. So it's better if you just say, I will give the test. But if you uh, do get an idea of the time, then you can use the have. For, in, for example, I will have given the test by next Monday. So you can add another word here by, only in some cases. Or I will have given the test until Tuesday. Or I will have given the test uh, during the next hour. So you can use different variations of these words or anything else that you might come across, but something that gives you an idea of the time. Okay, is, it, is this one clear? Yeah. Yes. All right. And uh, one important difference to know is between for and during. So for is always used for time periods like 10 years or one hour or a decade. During is uh, used for specific times like uh, during the morning or uh, during the night. And uh, one more word I want to add is since. Since is used for a point of time like since 12 o'clock or since 1980 or since the morning. So if you are referring to morning as a point in time, then you use since. But if you're using the morning as a, as a, like a, like a collection of different time points, then you can use for or during as well. So you need to rely on the meaning of the sentence and uh, then make a choice. So that's the first case when you have to use the perfect tense and you definitely have to, uh, there is no choice here. So it's like a compulsion, you have to use it. And the second case is when there are two actions happening in the past. So if both actions are happening in the past and you use the simple past tense, you won't uh, be able to clearly identify which one was still happening before the other. So for that, we use this rule that just use had because it's in the past for the action that happened earlier in the timeline. So for example, I reached the airport 
when the flight had left versus I had reached the airport when the flight left. So both of these sentences are grammatically correct, but they're just giving different meanings. So the rule says had, use had for the earlier one. So these are the hads. In the first sentence, I reached the airport when the flight had left. It suggests that first the flight left and then I reached. But in the second one, I had reached the airport when the flight left. In this first, I reached the airport and then the flight left. And what if I give you a third one? I reached the airport when the flight left. What do you think is the meaning of this sentence? I'm not using had in any of the two sentences, any of the two cases. They happen at the same time. Yes, it happened at the same time. So these uh, simple sentences are not giving you much to work with in respect to the time because you don't know what's the correct time. But in the longer sentences, in the GMAT sentence correction, you will have an idea of what's the logical uh, order in which these events are taking place and you use the had according to that order. So those are the only two cases where you'll be using um, the perfect tense. It could be it's most probably the had uh, in case of two actions happening in the past, but otherwise, if you use time, uh, you can use have, has, or had, any of them. Now the important difference between will and would, and I think this is something we covered in the first, very first class as well. So will is used for the future, and would is also used for the future. The difference is, will is used when you're talking from a present point of view for example right now i believe i will give a practice test so you have the present here and with that you're talking about the future so you use the will but if you're talking about the past so for example i believed yesterday that i would give a practice test today so you're speaking from a past point of view about the future. It does not matter whether that future has already happened or it is still in the future for us in the present. The point is that it was the statement was made from a past perspective and that's why you have to use a would. You cannot mix and match. You cannot use would for something that we think about in the present. And simply, um, you can't use will for something that we thought about in the past. Okay, is, is this rule clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, can you just tell once again, somehow? I'm... Sure. So let me use um, an example here. So let me use example of this class. I think we will cover reading comprehension in the class. So I'm making this statement about the future, but I'm making this statement right now. I think we will cover. Here you can't say, I think we would cover RC in the class. If you want to say something about that, you'll say, I thought we would cover, but we did not cover. Are you getting the meaning now? Yes, now it's clear. Right. So if you um, look at the options in the sentence correction question and you see that a few options have will and a few have would, uh, the first thing you need to do is find out when the action was taking place. Is it uh, in the present or is it in the past? And then you'll be able to eliminate a few options. So in a sense, it's a very good error to have in the question because you're able to eliminate a few options uh, at once, just choosing between will and would. Okay, so let me uh, explain the last rule. So this is the hypothetical rule that uh, you were talking about. 
So this is used only for hypothetical situations, which uh, are not going to happen in the real. So basically the structure is, if I were, I would do something. For example, if I were uh, the captain of the team, I would make the following substitutions. Or if you were my friend, you would have helped me. So there is a combination of the would and uh, some of these H words happening. For example, if you were a friend, you would help me. Let me just write W for would, you would help me. Now, I don't have a reference to the time in this case, so I'm just using would. But if I have a reference to the time, the same rule over here, it applies in this case. For example, if you were a friend, you would have helped me during the tournament or during the game. So now you have a reference, you have a word like during telling you when something is happening or happened. So you're talking about the past clearly. Uh, and yeah, this is going on. So any doubts about this particular rule? No. No? Okay. So let's move on to the next few rules. Okay. so. Uh, this is not tested a lot. You won't get it in uh, more than one question in the test, but it can come if you have these two words, if and then, in the sentence, especially the word if. So it's very important to know these four different cases when you have to use if and then. So, you know, if and then are conditional statements. And although it looks like if and then always go together, that's not the case. You don't always need a then. And as you see in all of these cases, I'm not using then. So then is more like optional. So you don't really need then. You can just start the sentence with if. So if you're talking about something really general, that means you don't have any connection with a specific time or a specific idea or a place or a person. So that would be general. And if you're sure about the outcome of that particular condition, then you use this kind of format. If I drink coffee, I feel better. So this is something that happens on a general basis and I'm using the simple present tense over here. So I'm just using the word feel. Now the second case, it is still general, nothing specific uh, happening, a specific event or a specific time, but there is some kind of uncertainty. So all you do is you add the words may, might, or can. May and might are similar to each other. If you get a choice, uh, if uh, this is the only decision that you need to make between two options, choose may. Otherwise, might is not technically wrong. And may and might refer both to the possibility of something happening, can refers to the ability of something happening. So that difference is pretty simple. But all you need to do in case of some uncertainty is add these words. And the third case, when you have something specific, for example, if I drink tea from my college cafe, so that is something really specific. And if you have certainty about it, because it's specific, uh, it is expected that you'll be certain about the outcome because you have done that action again and again. So if I drink tea from my college cafe, I will feel better. So this is a much more stronger version of that. So will feel, that means you're talking about the future. And why are we using the future here, but the present in the first sentence? Because the first sentence is more general. Uh, something like a universal truth, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So we always use present for all of these truths that are very general and they definitely happen. But for specific ones, uh, like in the third sentence, you have to use the will. And if you're talking about the future from a past perspective, you have to use would. For example, if I were 
to drink tea, I would feel better. So in this case, I'm using the hypothetical case once again. So is this fine? Any doubts in this so far? No. No? Okay. So one thing to remember is that the rules that you see in these uh, classes, these are the only rules that you'll be needing. So it's all about application of these rules. And uh, there are a limited number of rules that uh, you have to remember. And just the application is what you have to work on. Uh, the next rules are about commanding verbs, verbs like request, order, uh, recommend, command, uh, suggest. So especially in the longer sentences, you'll see something like this. The doctor recommended me to drink more water. So in this sentence, there is no error. Uh, this is completely fine. The doctor recommended me to drink more water. Sometimes in GMAT, they give you a different version of the same sentence. So the sentence will be, the doctor recommended that I drink more water. So you just have to know that uh, this is the version being used if you see the word that. So this is the first rule. If you use this kind of a version, you always have to use that. Second rule, never use the word should because when you say recommended that, the meaning of should is already uh, included in the meaning of a recommended. So you don't need to use should. And rule number three, you have to use a plural verb. For example, uh, if given a choice between drink and drinks, drinks is clearly the singular verb. Drink is the one that's used for plural nouns. So that's the plural verb. But in all cases, for this kind of a statement, you have to use the word drink. Even if I use another pronoun like he, you will still say he drink more water. The doctor recommended that he drink more water. It may sound a little uh, confusing right now. It may not sound correct, but this is uh, the correct form. So you can get either of these sentences. The doctor recommended him to drink more water versus the doctor recommended that he drink more water. Both are correct. But in the tough questions, you're more likely to get this one. Let me give another example. Uh, the government ordered that the committee pay the bill. So again, let's see if we are following these two rules or not. We are using that, we're not using should, and we are using a plural verb. So even if committee is singular, usually we'll say the committee pays the bill. But in this case, it's a little different. We'll say that the committee paid the bill. Is this rule fine? Did you understand this or do you need some more examples for this? A few more examples would be good. Okay. Uh, so let me remove the ink. Let me. Okay. Uh, for example, my trainer recommended that I start weight training. Now this is a little easier to uh, find because I'm using I with start, which goes otherwise as well. 
but if I just convert it into a he, that becomes more confusing. So my, uh, his trainer recommended that he start weight training. Or you can also say my trainer. Uh, so it could mean that the trainer is mine, but the recommendation is to another person. So the trainer recommended that he start weight training. Or uh, my, my uh, supervisor required that I complete the work simple or his supervisor required that he complete the work so how do you identify these sentences you'll be looking at these commanding words and that with them okay is this clear yes thank you yeah these are these are actually quite easy to identify after enough practice you'll be able to recognize these kinds of sentences very easily and i think you'll probably get at least one question that has a sentence like this so all right so before we go to some of the questions i want you to look at these uh, sentences one by one they all either have some error of verbs or uh, they're correct. So look at the first one and see if you can identify any error. And remember concision is also a key. So you have to be as concise as possible. Um, would it be Aldo Bernard normally eats expensive food? Okay. Aldo normally eats because you don't need the ing. Okay. What about this verb? Is this correct? Yeah, yeah, it seems fine. Yeah, because this is happening right now. Uh, so the ing is fine because it's a continuous action happening right now what about this wouldn't you use a future tense? yes so he will eat or he will be eating will be eating doesn't uh, really it's not needed so you'll just say he will eat lobster and steak at tomorrow's party okay the second sentence Because Cole wore a helmet when he was struck on the head. Yes, and uh, so this gives you an idea it's happening in the past. So, wore a helmet when he was struck. Uh, what about this? Has escaped. It can be right. He had. had escaped. He had escaped. Uh, yeah, I think. Okay, you can use he had escaped. Do you really need the had? No, I think this can be fine as well because he is still escaped. Yeah, you can just say he escaped serious escaped, injury. Escaped, yeah. Episode. Yeah, all right. Okay, third one. This one should be easy. Had lived, huh? Yeah. Uh, had lived lived or just lived yes just lived would be much better so don't get confused with this so this is just like uh, added to confuse you this action who died in 1791 even if you disregard this mozart lived in salzburg for most of his life now for the remaining sentence if you remove this part you don't really have any idea about the time. Like, did he live for 10 years or did he live for 20 years? If that was the case, then you should have used had. But otherwise, it's fine. Okay, and the fourth one.
just built would that be possible uh the local uh, had built had built. so definitely has is not correct you can use had built or built it depends on do you have a reference to time or if you have two actions happening in the past now in this case you have two actions in the past built and destroyed so obviously built came first so you should use the had right so that you get a uh, get an idea of what happened before and what happened later on okay let's try the top sentence Think it's correct. Could, could it be was awarded? Like instead of has been awarded? Has been awarded. Uh, yes, definitely. You have a time reference over here. Has been awarded. But you don't have something uh, very specific like uh, like during, for, until. It's better if you just use awarded here. You've already used has once here, so yeah, it's better if you use awarded a Pulitzer Prize yesterday. Okay, and this one. So already gives you an idea of the time. When the phone was ringing? Uh, this is just like the airport example. She had already woken up when the phone rang. So when shows that they're almost happening at the same time, not exactly, but almost, uh, but already gives you an idea that this action, the first one happened first. So she had already woken up when the phone rang. Okay. Uh, like she was awake when the phone rang? That'd be wrong. Uh, yeah, that that will be correct. Um, I think in this case, all I can say is that you need to look at the options. You might have that in the option, so that would also be correct. If you remove the word already and add something else. Yeah. Okay. And you may not find all the wrong versions of a sentence in the option, so you just have to work with the the options that you get. You would have to spend? Yes, because it is from a past perspective, so not the will, but the word. She would have to spend the night. And the other tenses are fine, not a lot of problem with them. Okay, what about the next one? Had walked on the moon, I think. Uh, yes, so this is going to be had because we're talking about the end of the Apollo program. Okay, the next sentence. If it is. Water freezes if it is cold, yes. Uh, now why we're not using were is because it's not a hypothetical situation. It is like a fact. So we can't say that this is uh, something fictional and that is why that rule doesn't apply here anymore. That's only for the fictional rules. Or when we are being sarcastic and we say something like, if you were my friend, you would have done this. Or if she were my friend, she would have done something for me. So this is not hypothetical. It does not apply here. Okay, this one. Will feel. Will feel better. Yes, and because it's in the past, if she swallowed this pill, she will feel better. 
if she if you just say something like swallows you'll just say helen feels better if she swallows this pill so again these uh, these sentences are actually quite short uh, to give you an idea of the real meaning so you have a different uh, word a, co a combination of different uh, let's say versions that work well so a lot of the different versions of the same sentence will be fine it just depends on the meaning okay and this one his boss wants him to stay at the office mm -hmm. Ethan is unsure what to do tonight. So let's just remove this part because it's not needed for the structure of the sentence. His boss wants that he stay at the office. Okay, this is fine. But his wife insists that he come home for dinner. Did you find any mistake in this or do you think it's correct? His boss wants that he stay at the office. To me, that doesn't sound interesting. Like, it doesn't sound correct because of the he stay but if you look at the last kind of uh, rule that we did the commands and requests and orders so this is similar to that so you have the that and you have the that here as well you don't have should anywhere so that's fine and you're using the plural form stay and come so it's all fine yeah this one is correct okay and these three before we go to the questions. Was developed. Yes. And what about is converted? Is it the correct tense? Yeah, because it continues to be that way. Yeah, and this is happening right now in the present. Um, so yeah okay and um, if you remove the which part directly connect the first and the last that also sounds correct yes that's true in this process coal is converted into a liquid fuel yeah what about this look okay to me yeah yeah, it's it's fine. Okay, and the last one. Is it required that every cyclist is able to be tested? Like not every you'll just say be tested okay be. new regulations require that every cyclist be tested for substances shouldn't it be required or just required required because it is in the present new regulations are required right now again i think uh, what i'll say is that it depends on the full sentence these are clearly like just looking at a sentence, you can't say if it's correct or there could be a better version because it depends on the options that you have. And in this case, since uh, nothing like the year has been mentioned that are these regulations for the present day or for the past, most of these options are going to have the same form required. But if you have something like um, new regulations in the 1850s, then you would say required. But if you have new regulations right now, then it will be required. Okay. So right. all of these versions are correct. So let's look at some questions now. And we'll solve the first question together. So first things first, look at the sentence. Should the Republican should the Republican Party become the minority party? Its ability to win a presidential election is determined by the number of democratic and independent voters it attracts so should the republican party become the minority party now this is talking about a hypothetical situation for example 
should you try the test? Something will happen or this will happen. So try to follow this same um, structure. Basically, should is being used for the word if. So let's look at the first sentence. Its ability to win a presidential election is determined by the number of this and this voters it attracts. Uh, all right, so it may not be a verb error, so I'll just give you a hint. Do you think there's a pronoun error in this? Yeah. What's, what's that error? It's. Yes, yeah, so whenever you see these words like it's and it, just be careful. Uh, there might be an error. And in this, the error is that you might be confused between the Republican Party and the minority party. So it's a little ambiguous here. So that's why we eliminate A. And for the same reason, you can eliminate C. Okay, B, D, and E. So now I want you to read these three options and then see which ones you can eliminate. Um, would it be as D as well? D as B. So D is wrong according to both of you, right? Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah. yeah, okay. The number of it attracts determined because it's wrong. Uh, what about E? It would have. Do you need the word here? No, no. no. So again, this is wrong, and B is the answer will determine its ability to win the presidential election. Okay, any any doubt on this question? No. No. Okay, one thing I want to add here is that you can probably add to your notes as well. So I'm saying, should the Republican Party become the minority party? That's a hypothetical situation. If you want to use the word if in place of should, you have to take care of this verb here. It should be, if the Republican Party becomes the minority party. Okay, so both of them are correct, but you just need to be aware of which version goes where. So if the Republican Party becomes the minority party is also correct, and should the Republican Party become the minority party is also correct. So. Basically, the rule you need to write is that if you start the sentence with a should for something hypothetical, you have to maintain the plural verb. Should this happen? And um, this is also something I want you to do when you solve these different questions. You may come across different versions of the same rules that we have been studying in class. Uh, do keep adding those rules somewhere to where you have the remaining rules. Okay, so as I said, you'll be getting really long sentences in this class because you have a lot going on. Let's look at this sentence. Classical guitar was... Uh, uh, before that, I, I had a small uh, question, doubt in the previous one, which can just go? Uh, yeah. Back, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it says, if it was not for this it at the end, mm -hmm. uh, so was this it's correct? its ability to win a presidential election was actually referring to the uh, Republican, the Republican party. party. Yes. Uh, and what could have been the right one for voters uh, it attracts? Uh, in option A, how do you make option A correct? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Okay. Should the Republican party become the minority? I think um, 
apart from the pronoun ambiguity, there is also this question of this one is determined by because we're talking about something hypothetical. So most probably we should be using the future tense here. This will happen. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's read this one. Classical guitar was neither prestigious nor was often played in concert halls. Okay. So I'm going to stop right here because so in the test, if you think that there's an error in the first part, you can just stop right there. Uh, if both of you have attended the the first couple of classes, you might know there's something that I told about neither and nor. Do you remember that? Yeah. Either or, neither nor. Yeah, it should be immediately, nor should be immediately followed by nor played. Yes, and um, this is something that is covered in idioms error also. So whatever comes after neither should match what comes after nor. But in the original sentence, what comes after neither is just an adjective, prestigious. What comes after nor is a verb. So they don't match, and that is why we can be safe and already eliminate option A. So if you go very quickly through all of these, was neither prestigious nor played often. Uh, they kind of match. It was neither prestigious nor played often was not prestigious, not often played, it's fine, did not have prestige, neither prestigious nor was often played. Okay, so because of the same error, he is also gone. Now let's read the remaining sentence. Until it was revived by this person in the mid 20th century, having been won over by the instrument's sound, despite its relative obscurity. Okay, so now what I want you to do is go through these three options, read them in detail, look at the differences between these options, and then make a choice. Okay, any option you'd like to eliminate? B and B. Uh, and why is that? Is it because of the it's? Yeah, and also um, having been won over, like that's, you don't really know if Andre is the one being won over. Okay. So in this case, instruments sound. Uh, now, one thing I want to add here, which should go under the category of pronoun errors is that if you're using a pronoun 
uh, if you're using this uh, pronoun, it's you can't use it for a noun that has an apostrophe s after it. Because now this is no longer a noun. What you have here is a description of sound. So basically, all of this instrument sound, it represents this noun, which is sound. So if you say the sound's relative obscurity, it won't make sense. All right, so that's the reason why B and D are correct. Is, is this part clear to both of you? Yeah. Right? Yes, and uh, yeah. uh, it, nor it was played, I think, right? Performed would be a wrong, I mean, you had already marked it, of course. So. Yeah, because you're changing uh, the meaning of the sentence. Although technically played and performed might be the same, but you can't make these uh, big changes. So yeah, that's also one reason. So all you need to do is when you're left with, uh, let's say the last three options, very carefully look at the differences between these options. And then you'll be able to make much better choices. Like as soon as you identify this, it's problem, you should have been able to eliminate B and D very quickly. And although it's a, it looks like a very difficult question, it is easily doable in uh, one minute. So all you need to do is first find out this neither nor error, and then you need to find out the it's error, and you'll be able to select C as the answer. Okay, so let's move to another question. Okay, let's do this one also together. So during the 19th century, you have the word during here. Emily Eden, the just scholar E and F, journeyed throughout India, sketching and keeping journals, forming the basis of news reports about the princely states where they had visited. Okay, so first of all, you need to ensure that whatever answer you choose should match the remaining sentence in the beginning and at the end as well. Uh, so I want you to quickly go through the ends of these options. Just look at this part and see if there's any option that does not match the visited. You'll probably have to read the whole, uh, whole options first, but still make a choice. And also see if you really need the word where. To me, it appears E is more concise, or maybe I'm wrong. Oh, uh, okay. So A and D, uh, definitely you should rule out because you don't need the where. You never say, this is the place where I had visited. You just say, this is the place that I visited. All right, so you don't need the where, it's just extra. Okay, let's look at option B. Uh, sketching and keeping journals that were forming the basis of news reports about the princely states visited. So this statement does not have the they, so it could also mean visited by someone else. So it changes the meaning of the sentence. And secondly, it has were forming. It doesn't make much sense to use the continuous tense here. It's not like the process was continuing. And uh, so we have C versus E, which one will you choose? E. E, yes. And can you give a reason to eliminate C? They have visited. It should yes. be. And it's clearly happening in the 19th Which? century. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, go ahead, Lakshmi. We're saying something. So if it had, they had, would that be correct? They had visited. Um, in that case, had would not be correct because these two actions journeyed throughout India and visited. They're happening simultaneously with each other at the same time. So you're not sure which is happening first. Uh, so had would not be a correct uh, replacement for have. Okay. Yeah. And there's also another error to form the basis. That was not their like intention. They did not journey through India sketching and keeping journals to form the basis. But it's like later on, their journals formed the basis of news reports. Otherwise, they would just say to inform news reports, not you can't form the basis of something. So you don't intentionally form the basis of news reports. So that doesn't make sense with respect to the meaning. So let's go to the next question. Okay. So I'm going to give uh, time to you to solve this from beginning to the end. B or D, I don't know. Okay, so definitely you don't need was chosen by him. It's too uh, lengthy. So let's remove A. C is also too wordy. Resignation was a choice made by him. So one thing extra that I want to add here is something that you'll be doing in modifier. So this first part, this is what we call a modifier. It gives you a description about something. So for example, after I did my homework, so what should be the next logical word over here? What do you think should be the next word? If you try to form a sentence. Something I? Yes. After I did my homework, I did something because this is a modifier which is basically describing something that I did. So I am the subject of this whole group of words. So I will have to come next. Similarly, in this case, after Nixon spent months doing something, something, he did something else again. So the logical next word should be he, and that is why B is also eliminated. Because anyways, B does not say who chose resignation instead of impeachment. You have to mention he chose. All right, now between D and E, he chose resignation, which is a noun, rather than being impeached, which is a verb, versus he chose to resign, which is a verb, 
rather than phase impeachment, which is also a work. So because of the error of uh, parallelism, which we will be doing later on in the next few classes, so it's better if you keep both verbs. You don't mix and match a noun with a verb. And that is why E is eliminated and D becomes the answer. Okay. Even for E, uh, the being impeached, uh, is, it, is it too wordy or? Uh, I don't know. Uh, being impeached would mean that, yeah, it's giving you a different meaning than facing impeachment. And uh, also options, try not to use the being as much as possible, especially in the beginning of sentences but even within the sentences, because being is usually just extra, there is always a better version out there instead of using being impeached. Okay. Okay, thank you. So from every elimination that we make, every wrong option, you should be able to like uh, get a new learning or learn something, something about some rule. And even when you review your questions, when you solve questions, you should always have a very strong reason why you eliminate an option. Just because it doesn't like uh, sound correct is not enough. You need to find out why it doesn't sound correct. So that you can be more sure and confident of your answers. Okay, so another long sentence. So you have a couple of minutes to try this one. Or maybe more, you can take a few more minutes.
Okay, any option that you've eliminated till now? I eliminated E and D. Okay. Uh, Priyanka, what about you? Um, I got D, so I eliminated everything. Okay. So let's look at the last option. On September 26th, so instead of all reading this again and again, let's just call him S and reduce the word. And they normally do this in GMAT just to confuse you. If you look at it, the actual sentence is pretty uh, like simpler as compared to this. Okay, on September 26, on this date, S likely prevented the US and Russia from, okay, so prevented from is fine prevented these two countries from entering a war when he disobeyed orders from his superiors to retaliate and correctly judged. So clearly correctly judged happened before he disobeyed orders. And according to this sentence, they're happening at the same time. So it doesn't give you the correct meaning, it's false. Let's look at D on September 26th. S correctly judged that the reports of the missile were false, disobeying orders. So these are two separate actions. They're not, again, part of each other. So you shouldn't be using uh, this option without using and. And let's go to C. S likely prevented a large scale nuclear war between these two countries on this by correctly judging that the reports were false. Comma disobeying orders. When you have two actions, you have to use the and. Missing. So C is not. B. If S had not correctly judged the system, correctly judged the system, uh, that's going to be wrong because the judgment is not being made of the system, it's being made of the reports. So B is eliminated and A is the answer. Okay, so go through these options and see if you have any question or any doubt anywhere. So in B and A, I was confused between B and A. So, so, and then disobeyed orders. So, that should be correct, right? Uh, yeah. There's no, there's no problem in that because it gives you an idea of what happened first, and then what happened, which makes sense in this case. That is even right for A as well. Uh, yes. Not and then in there. That's why. Yeah, it, it's fine then is fine. One more difference that I just noticed was likely would have versus would likely have entered. So definitely A is, uh, A is much better than B option. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. So we might be spending a little extra time on the sentence correction today, but that's okay because this error is quite uh, important and tricky. Okay, so we have a short question now. Is it C? Oh, the C. Okay, let's first look at the ends of these options. Or not is not needed. So that's another rule you need to remember. 
if you use whether, you don't need the or not with it. So A, E is gone. If mainly dependent on if the public was prepared to make an effort, uh, whether is much better than the if here. Okay, you say C. So this is a confusing question because all of these mean different things and none of them is absolutely wrong. So what we do is, in this case, we will stick to the tense that was being followed in the non-underlined part of the sentence. So it's last year, the ecologist announced. So try and stick to the past tense, just to maintain a bit of parallelism here. So because of that, depends and will depend will be eliminated. Okay, is it fine? Any doubt in this one? Uh, it was like last year, so he announced last year and and Nicolas. See, even if you were last year, uh -huh. even if you depend, right? Yeah, but if you were talking about the future. Uh, the, it should have used would depend. Do you remember the rule of will versus would? Because all of this is happening in the past. So any kind of announcement in the for the future should use would. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so let's try this. This is from one of the official guides, I think. And it's a very, very good question. Just one thing I want to add here is something, uh, it's a very simple rule which you must have covered in grammar classes in school. Words like fish, deer, sheep, singular and plural, they use the same form. They don't use any S after them.
Okay, so let me eliminate one option. So based on this rule, and if you look at the hints given in the non-underlined portion, we are treating as, as plural. So it quickly replaces it. So you can't refer to one starfish. So A is eliminated. Okay. Now if you look at C, it says they lose one arm. Uh, they quickly replace it. It looks like if there are, let's say, 10 starfish and one of them loses one arm, they all collectively replace that one arm belonging to that one starfish, which does not make sense here. So C is also eliminated. Now, apart from these, did you choose any answer out of B, D, and E? I chose D, but I was confused between E and D. Okay, so you think it's between B and E. What about you, Lakshmi? Yeah, uh, I think it's B. B, okay. So definitely not D. They lose one arm. They are quickly replaced. It looks like the starfish are replaced. Uh, they lose one arm. Oh, it says, and if they lose one arm, it should be something like they lose one arm each or they lose one arm respectively. It is quickly replaced. Uh, yeah, so E is eliminated and B is the answer. If one arm is lost, it is quickly replaced with the animal overcompensating and growing an extra one or two. So definitely you need the and. So B is fine. All right. Let us try one more. Okay. Um, and just before we start solving the question, do you know the difference bet uh, between these two words, between and among? It's in terms of numbers. So between is used for two. Among is used for either more than two or when the number is unknown. So keep that in mind when you solve this question. It's C. Okay. okay, you think it's C. Uh, so definitely A and B are gone because we're talking about winning players. Have raised. Are we able to have raised? Uh, it's wrong among them. Okay, Lakshmi, what was your answer? Um, just thinking between C and E. Okay. Uh, about 70% of the cost was uh, I don't think it's E, it's C. Yes, we're not talking about what was raised. You have to mention the fact about their ability because that would take away from the meaning of the sentence, which you have to maintain. So C is the answer. Mm, definitely. Although now, now look at E, it looks really short as comparison to C, but that is not the the criteria that you go with. First look at grammar, uh, which is correct in both of them. Then look at the meaning, which E changes. And if E had the same meaning, then you would choose the shorter one. But right now C is fine. And let's do one more question of verbs before going ahead. Okay, long one.
there's just one change I'd like to make in all of them, which is add the word off. D. B. Okay, B. Um, I got D. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, all right. So let's see. First is the difference uh, that you notice in the beginning of every option. So. The Middle Stone Age extended for 200,000 years. The Middle Stone Age was extended for 200,000 years. The Middle Stone Age extending for 200,000 years. So out of these, uh, Priyanka, do you think in B option this is correct? No, I don't, but the rest seemed correct than the others. So. Yeah, okay. So this is definitely, um, it's wrong because was extended signifies that some other force is extending the Middle Stone Age. For example, I raised money for a charity versus I was raised. So the second sentence suggests that something was done to me. So it can't be was extended because no one made it extend for 200,000 years. So B is eliminated because of that, it changes the sense of the sentence. The other four are fine. Let's go to the next part of the sentence. So the Middle Stone Age, extended for these many years, is marked. So we're not talking about the present, so it's wrong. Is marked by the intelligent manufacture by the tribals of glues used for fixing the heads a complex process that in the absence of empirical means of observation requires more mental and abstract perception than modern technology. Okay, so A is eliminated because of the is. Is there any other option? Okay, Lakshmi, you chose D. And marked by the intelligent manufacturer. So this is same in all, manufactured by the tribal of glues, tribals of glues used for fixing heads, a complex process that in the absence of this requires. Uh, okay, one choice I want you to make is between required and requires. Which one do you think is better? Do you think that process still exists? No. No, it doesn't exist because it's so old. So you can't use requires. And that is why option 
D is eliminated and you can't use requires here. So it has to be out of required. So it's C versus E now. Now let's look at the differences one by one. Extended for years, so this is same. Was marked by the intelligent manufacturer by the tribals of blues. Now this is the difference. Which they used for fixing the heads versus glues used for fixing heads. Any choice you would like to make right now? E. E. Are the tribals of glues used for fixing heads to the spears required far more mental and abstract perception than does? Okay, this is another difference between C and E. That's why I didn't like any of them because I feel like than does does not, I mean, is not to me doesn't look correct. And the in C, which they. Okay. So in this case, see does, you don't really need the does. Uh, and if I were in the test, I would definitely select C as the answer. Now let's read it once again. So the Middle Stone Age, let's just remove these extra parts here. Let's shorten the sentence. Who is marked by the intelligent sisters? Let me just remove all the extra stuff that is here. Okay, so the Middle Stone Age was marked by the intelligent manufacture by the tribals of blues, which they used for fixing heads, a complex process that required far more perception than modern technology. So do you think there's something wrong in C? Versus E? Okay, so I've reduced E as well. So I already read C, let's read D once, uh, E once again. So the Middle Stone Age was marked by the intelligent manufacture by the tribals of glues used for fixing honed heads, a complex process that required far more perception than does. So I think between C and E, the only difference is between the than and than does because these parts, the which they is also correct. And this is also correct. There's no grammatical or uh, meaning problem in them. So you will have to make the decision based on does, which is much more clearer error than any other error you would think about these parts. So based on that, you'll have to make the choice between C and E, and uh, you should be getting C as the answer. Okay, if you have uh, any questions about this. I failed to see required, I and mean, I just somehow missed it. But uh, if I make this required, mm -hmm. would this be a better answer? Uh, in which option, D? Yes. Okay, required. I just wanted to check that. Let's read this. Extending, uh, extending for these ears. I think one difference is also between extended and extending. But let's keep that on the side for now. The Middle Stone Age, extending for these many years and marked by the intelligent manufacturer by the tribals of glues, used for fixing heads. Uh, no, in that case, See, if you say the Middle Stone Age, extending for these many years and marked by the manufacturer, then this uh, part of the sentence doesn't really match well with the first part of the sentence. Let me shorten this and write it down. So let's say the Middle Stone Age, extending and marked 
So whatever comes here in these blanks should talk about the Middle Stone Age, right? Did you get this part? The Middle Stone Age. And then you have some description about it extending for these many years and marked by something. Was so a, a complex process is also talking about Middle Stone Age, right? So that, that's not correct. No, the complex process is talking about this uh, fixing horned heads to the spears and arrows. That is the complex process. Oh, okay. Because yeah, that it. is the complex process that needs more perception than modern technology. So you're basically comparing this process that needed a lot of perception to the modern technology that we have today. Okay, got it. Thank okay. you. So I think it's more of a meaning issue about uh, the doubt that you have about D. Okay, so as you've seen in these uh, questions, these work questions are really, really tricky and that's why we've almost uh, spent two hours only on verbs. But even when you go through the questions and you practice them, you'll see you'll be making a lot of mistakes. But just keep noting down the errors that are there in every option that you eliminate. And if you ever get a chance, if you have a few questions that you do not understand or you do not get, you can always email them to me and uh, we can discuss some of them in the class as well. Okay, so uh, let's do a little bit of reading comprehension first and then we will come back to critical reasoning if we have time. Otherwise, we'll do the critical reasoning in the next class. So, okay, so let me quickly revise the reading comprehension strategy which I talked about in the last class. So I did tell that most of the passages you will have, probably all of them, will have a question on primary purpose. Now this question can either be on the whole passage or it can be on a particular paragraph as well. So it's always a good idea when you take down notes, always note down what is the primary purpose of each paragraph. And by summing all of them, you get the primary purpose of the whole passage. The second is, the steps that you need to carry out. The first step is you read the passage and you map it simultaneously, which should be done in about uh, three to six minutes on an average. And this has to be done before because you can't go to the next question until you solve the first question in front of you. So it's a good idea to uh, read everything beforehand. Do it paragraph wise and you should know the purpose or role of each paragraph. You don't need to write specific details like names of people in detail or dates and all, but if you get a question on something really specific, you should be able to go back to part of the passage using the map. And form an idea of the structure. For example, um, the author introduces a concept, gives examples of it, and discusses the disadvantages of that process. So something like that, have an idea of the structure of the passage. The next step would be predict what's the primary purpose because you will get a question on that, write that down. The next step is look at the question in front of you, understand it, predict the answer before going through the options and then eliminate. And for eliminating, uh, there are a few common options that you need to eliminate. You need to eliminate the, the very strong options, the ones that have words like never, always, options that do the opposite of what you want, options that are totally out of scope. So we'll be discussing more of these as we do the passages. So here is a passage in front of you. We will be doing questions on um, these passages, but what I want you to do is for the next four to five minutes, spend time on mapping this passage and then find out what's the primary purpose of the passage. So you have about four to five minutes and I'll also map the passage simultaneously.
Okay, just let me know if uh, when you're done. I'm done. Done. Okay. Uh, Lakshmi, what about you? You've read and mapped the passage. Yes. Okay. So uh, I won't go into the details, but tell me. Um, let's start with Lakshmi. What do you think is the primary purpose of the whole passage? It is. Uh... The, it is trying to tell that uh, uh, regulations, uh, the environmental regulations, are uh, uh, you know affect all com the, the first this line I think affect all competitors in given industry uni uh, in in in, a, in is not uniform. I mean it, it affects everyone in a different way, mm -hmm. and thereby uh, the in. Uh, environmental managers can help their companies by you know addressing how changing regulations will affect their companies okay and uh, priyanka do you want to add something or change something no that sounds good okay so they do talk about uh, being uniform but that's pretty much the end of it the whole passage is about the reality that it's different so instead of writing the primary purpose as a special uh, like sentence in your notes, you can just probably highlight that this is the primary purpose of the passage, and also this part is the primary purpose of the passage. 
So now let's look at the question, which is primary purpose of the passage. You have a prediction in your mind. Let's look at the options one by one. So option A, address a widespread environmental management problem. First of all, you should stop here. It's not about managing the environment. It's all about the regulations. And there are no solutions to that problem because that problem doesn't exist in the first place. And we're not talking about solutions. So look at these keywords very carefully. So A is eliminated because of that. B, illustrate varying levels of compliance with environmental regulation among different corporations. Now, this is a very good example of a trap answer because option B is something that is definitely happening in the passage. B is, is having a very high probability of being chosen as the answer because it completely matches what's happening, but it's not answering our question, which is the primary purpose of the passage. And it's also missing out the part about, um, about the environmental manager, so it does not include everything. So B is eliminated because of that. C, describe the alternatives to traditional methods. We are not talking about any traditional method of environmental management. So we are definitely not talking about the alternatives. So C is also eliminated. D, advocate. Okay, if let me ask you a question here. Advocate versus, advocate increased corporate compliance versus correct a common misconception. If you had to choose based on only these few words, which one would you choose as the answer? E. E, yes. E is correct. This word advocate is wrong because the passage is not suggesting us as a reader to do something or managers in general to do something. Uh, the remaining part of the option D is fine, but this word advocate should be the trigger word, the word that makes you eliminate option D. So one thing I want you to remember is these words are very, very important in a primary purpose question, and they can often be the reason why you eliminate it. And each and every word is very, very important. You did not see a whole lot of um, extreme answers here, which is anyways rare in a primary purpose question. Uh, but you have to carefully look at each of these parts of that option, like solutions is the one that made it wrong here. Uh, B option was a trap. It is happening, but it's not answering the question. It's correct, but it's not answering that question. So just a few of the common reasons why we eliminated these options. Okay, any question before we move on to the next question? Any doubt? No. No? No. no. Okay. So we had only one question on this passage, I think. All right. Okay, so this is a long one. Uh, so I won't have much space to draw, so I'll probably just highlight a few important points. So you have about four to six minutes to map this passage.
Okay, let me know when you're done. I'm done. Okay, Lakshmi, what about you? Um, still reading. Just give me one minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Found something. Uh, so let's start with uh, Priyanka. What do you think is the primary purpose of the passage? Um, to pretty much illustrate the journey of Eleanor Roosevelt and how she's been depicted throughout history and in various works, and um, the contradictions of her image, how she values. Um, um, feminism in a way in the social context of the woman, but at the same time cherishes the motherly instinct and the nurturing nature of some of them. Okay. Uh, Lakshmi, would you like to add something or change something? Uh, no, it's the same thing. It's talking, the author is directly talking about uh, the, uh, the biography of uh, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. I didn't write the name actually. And uh, yeah, starting talking about the ups and downs, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, about the uh, the the uh, social the, uh, what I can say. Um, the context, um, like what was happening around. Yeah. So uh, it, it, I I actually found that in between in in the second passages that they there was a switch in the way the author is explaining about uh, her, her biography mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it says uh, depicts a generation of privileged women born in late 19th century and maturing in 20th so that was one line which i'm still confused about what does it actually mean so this this line over here Yeah, this is just uh, talking about the social context because just like ER herself, so I'm using the word ER for Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, she was born in the late 19th century and uh, matured in the 20th century. So it's like a lot of people who are born in the 1990s and then transition to the 2000s. And they also transition from old traditions to the new ones. And that's why their life is full of contradictions. And then they explain those contradictions. So, um, yeah, I think you both have a good idea of what the primary purpose is. And just remember that there are a total of three biographies that are mentioned here. Two that were written by Lash, and this is where Lash is. And the one that was written by Scarf. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Let's look at the first question. The passage as a whole is primarily concerned with which of the following? Okay, so you have your prediction in mind. Let's look at A, changes in the way in which her life is understood. Do you think it's, it is matching what you said? You don't need to make a very strong choice right now if you want to keep it in the option. Yeah, all right, so let's keep this. What about B, social changes that made possible the role played by her in social reform? Is that the primary concern to talk about the social changes? No. No. Now, although these are mentioned, so it is a trap answer, but that's not the primary purpose. So B is gone. Changes in the way historians have viewed lives of American women. That's too general. No. So we remove that because it has to be about Roosevelt. 
social changes that resulted from the activities. No, we're not talking about social changes that she caused. So that's the wrong order. It's basically not mentioned. And changes in social roles that American women have played. Again, it's too general. Yes. You're talking about ER. Yes, we are only talking about her. And we have American women as part of the context, but not as the primary concern. So A is going to be the answer. And see, if you have a very good prediction in mind, what is the purpose of the passage, you don't need to look at the passage again. And we solved this question without looking at the text. You only need to look at the map that you have. Now, the next one. The author credits which of the following for making possible the current understanding of Roosevelt's career? So this is, uh, this is a general question, but you may have to go back to your notes. See if you can eliminate a few of these options on the basis of your map. Otherwise, we'll go back to the passage. There are a few really blatantly wrong options here. See if you can eliminate them. The fifth one? It's yes. Wrong. Associating David feminist as well. And okay. also, also her husband's presidency. That there was no, it's not official record. Okay. Yeah, and the recent studies of feminists of the gender. Yeah, so only one remains, yeah. Uh, so which one are you choosing? Are you choosing first one? Yeah. Okay, now I want you to look at the question once again. The author credits which of the following for making possible. That means what is the cause of how we understand her career today? Is it because of work of historians in the 1970s or recent studies of feminists of her generation? I want to look back. Let me just go back. I think I have a doubt here. History of women. Uh, it is about Roosevelt. Yes. Yeah, and the first line itself, I think it gives. See, what about this? This is actually um, giving you the answer. Let me go to the question once again. The author credits which of the following for making possible the current understanding of this. Thanks to Scarf and others, so these are definitely these historians, her activities have become intelligible, so we are able to understand it. So yes, current understanding, so yes, is this one is the answer. Yeah. Okay, so any question about these questions, the options, the passage, anything? No. No? All right, let's try one more passage. Um, okay, so we will be doing three questions on this passage. And uh, so you can take four to five minutes to map this passage.
Do let me know when you're done. 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 Okay. Uh, Lakshmi, are, have you done? Have you done this? Yes. Okay. So I have um, a general question. So are they discussing a process or a problem with its solution? How would you classify this passage as? What are they discussing? Uh, they are basically talking about the uh, Javan Rhino, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, this thing. Let's just call it JR. JR, yeah. I even I wrote JR. So, uh, <clears throat> and then um, over the period of time, they're talking about the uh, near extension of that species and the splitting of uh, 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 splitting of this uh, uh, DNA. Uh, I mean, the, they are different species now: the Vietnamese herd and the Javan rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, and at the end, they're talking about uh, in in Indonesia the, these rhinoceros are protected, whereas in Vietnam there is less chances of you know uh, reviving this because of uh, uh, there are too few to maintain necessary genetic genetic variations. So uh, and yeah. Um, and at the end, they are saying human is I mean, the human interference is not helping much, and uh, because of the past human uh, human treatment. Okay, so uh, yeah, Priyanka, what? How do you understand this sentence as the last one? So this is pretty much saying that it's kind of ironic because currently humans are not interfering, but that's not really proving to aid the rhinos in any way because mm -hmm. they need the they need the shrubs or whatever that uh, occurs instead of a dense forest. Yeah, so we basically, uh, humans have been bad in the past, but right now humans could help. Uh, all right, so... Uh, their help is not, uh, I mean, it's not proving anything. I mean, it's not helping much at this moment. That's what I think. May prove little better than past human treatment. Uh, so that means... Like it's, it's almost the same thing. Saying that like the the fact that they humans think they're helping them by not coming into their habitat, but that's actually not helpful. Yeah, so the benevolence is actually not a very good thing that just by saying that we won't interfere at all, that's yeah, not it's futile. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. So that's also um, uh, there's a word for that. It's basically like uh, whatever we want it's it's the opposite of that it's counteractive so let me just put the word here so you have to be very aware of these uh, shifts that happen within these passages like it's going in some direction and then it changes and moves in another direction and you should also be aware of the reasons they give for these uh, uh, why indonesia is going to work but vietnam is not going to work you might get really specific questions on that so let's go to the first question, which is an inference question. Now, one thing I want to talk about in inference, and it applies to critical reasoning also, inference is something that should be 100% true. It is not mentioned directly, but it should always be 100% true. So if you choose any option, it has to be 100% true according to the passage. So let's go through these options. First of all, A, these JRs are one of the most endangered animals on the planet. We know they're endangered, but are they one of the most endangered animals on the planet? Do you have evidence for that? No. no. It is called the rarest large animal on, large mammal on earth, near extinction. But it's not one of the most endangered animals, according to the passage. Right? Yeah. yeah. So A is eliminated. It may yeah, be. And also, uh, they have mentioned that um, uh, in Indonesia, their survival is like still better. Yes. So definitely A is crossed out. Okay, B. 
more is known about the genetics than about mating patterns. Now it won't be in uh, it won't be directly mentioned anywhere, but see if you can infer it from the information that's given to you. Well, it's both kind of similar in a way because you're saying that the Indonesian herd cannot mate with the Vietnamese herd because of the genetic diversity. Okay, so that is about like interspecies. Is it possible or not? but focus on this word mating patterns now what do you need to know about mating patterns you definitely need to know how females behave how males behave and if you don't even know that females do they even have horns or not you definitely can't know much about the mating patterns right yes that's right? true but you do know you do have dna that has been garnered so B is definitely, it is one of our strong uh, contenders because you do know more about the DNA than how do females even look like. So let's keep this. Okay, what about C? Hunters killed more in Vietnam than in Indonesia. We do have hunters here, shot them on site. This is the only reference to hunters. Do you think it matches C? No. No. Because this uh, comparison that is being made here, we don't have numbers for that. Okay, D. Most animal extinctions are the result of human actions. It's a pretty strong... It's strong. It can't be. No, we do not know. We only know about uh, the JR. That's the direct result of human actions, but not about other animals. So D is gone. And E is also pretty strong, most important factor. Do you think that's inferred? No. 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 Usually these options are wrong, the ones that have most in them. So B is correct. And you get that from this part of the passage. So let's move to another question on the same uh, passage. Okay, I want you to solve this one yourself. So I'll give you one minute to solve this one. What you can do is look at the first word, make a few eliminations, and then look at the second word and make few other eliminations. Okay, do you have an answer? Yeah, D. Okay, let's keep D. Uh, Lakshmi, what do you think is the answer? Yeah, I'm confused between B and D. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, like there is pointless and there is ironic and then there's problematic and doom. Okay, uh, so we have a total of 10 words. Which words are totally wrong? Optimistic is wrong because we are not talking about uh, being positive. Heroic doesn't make sense. Profitable is not mentioned. Yeah, so these three options are gone. B and D. Pointless, doomed, problematic, ironic. So definitely there is irony. So we can't rule that one out. There is a problem right now because 
near extinction is happening so let's keep that pointless and doomed now the answer is d and the way you eliminate b is because b is being too extreme in the same direction it's saying yeah, it's that's what i was thinking it was little extreme doomed is like little extreme right yeah like there's no chance that it may survive so that is true for the vietnamese herd if you talk about that but uh, the indonesia they are protected they still have genetic diversity to have a chance so basically they do have a chance and b would be too extreme for them so b is eliminated because of that so in this kind of a question you don't need to read each and every word and make a decision based on each word just look at first half of the options and then the second half of the options so based on the first half you would have eliminated a and c uh, and even e i would say and you don't even need to read the other words and then make a decision based on the other two words so just basically save some time okay so let's do another question on the same passage uh, this is based only on the first paragraph and this is purpose of the first paragraph so let's do this one together discuss different types of rhinos that populate the world what do you think about this no no so although the indian rhino and african and sumatran are mentioned but that's not the purpose the purpose is still about the javan rhinos so a is gone b describe the ways in which human actions have brought the jr into extinction now if you don't read that was in the second paragraph right yes and if you are in a hurry in the test and don't read this first you might choose b as the answer so b is gone it would be the answer to the second paragraph c outline the few known facts about the jr that could be that could that be that could be yeah d discuss the steps taken no no that was also in second paragraph yes and that too it wouldn't be the purpose of the second paragraph because the purpose would be to show that we can't say one species but there is some hope for the other species so this wouldn't be the purpose of any of the paragraphs uh, although it is mentioned somewhere and e no again the second second paragraph yeah yeah it's the second one and so that's also trap answer and c is fine okay so that is it for the reading comprehension uh, this week do you have any questions before we move to a little bit of critical reasoning no no um so um, uh, so is this the uh, complexity of the questions that we will we can expect for a uh, 700 level or is it uh, even more complex so it's like this that uh, the passage is same but there can be different levels of questions for the same passage but if you look at um, i think this question is a little easier this would be a 600 plus question usually these ones this would be a tough question 700 plus uh and also i think this one this one uh and what about this yeah primary purpose ones are usually tough and these passages are also a uh, little tough so uh, is it like an, uh, the a scoring is not as for the passage or is it like per question it is per question so uh, like ideally a passage could have about uh, seven to eight questions but the four questions that you will get will depend on the level of the questions that you solved before that so that also changes but definitely there are some passages that are more difficult to understand and some that are easier to understand Uh, but if you have an easy passage the questions will also be easy they will range like from 300 to 500 if you have a tough passage like these are tough passages they are short but they are tough and they would range from 600 to 700 like that okay thank you yeah 
All right, so uh, what I want you to do for reading comprehension is keep practicing um, how do you map a passage, and you should be able to do that for every passage in the official guide, and then solve these primary purpose questions. So we have a few minutes. Let's solve a few critical reasoning questions. Okay, before that, let's just recap what we have done in critical reasoning so far. So last week we talked about assumption questions and uh, we talked about weakening questions, how weakening questions are the ones you will most probably see in the test and then assumption and strengthen. So one difference between assumption and strengthening questions was that assumptions are always fixed and they are not fictional versus strengthening where these options are always fictional. So you will always find these two words with all the strengthening questions, if true. So you just have to uh, build a hypothesis that if true, would this action, would this particular argument strengthen the argument or not? And then for assumption questions, there was this test that you can do. You try to negate your answer for only the assumption questions and see if it weakens the answer or not. And it doesn't work for strengthening questions like that. But this is for last week. What we're doing today is we will be solving a few strengthening questions. And you have to remember these wrong options. Extreme options, like always, never, none, most, or everyone, these are usually wrong. If an option is too broad or too narrow, like too much beyond scope or too much uh, like a subset of the scope, that's going to be wrong. If an option uses incorrect comparisons that do not actually uh, support the statement that's going to be wrong if it mentions appeals to authority like just because um, a manager said this the argument does not get strengthened if there's an option that does nothing it doesn't really matter again that option is going to be wrong and if you have a strengthening question and the option is weakening the argument that will obviously be wrong and these all wrong options, they also apply to the reading comprehensions as well. So what we're going to do is just solve a few questions. So let's try this question. Let's do this one together. So first step is read the argument so that you know what you're looking for. Which of the following, if true, would together with the information above provide the best basis for the claim that Charred bone fragments are evidence of use of fire by early hominids. So this is the claim, this is the conclusion. So let's look at the statements. In this territory, archaeologists discovered these bone fragments. So they got these bone fragments dating one million years ago. Analysis, which came from variety of animals showed that they had been heated no higher than those produced in experimental campfires made from branches of white stink or the most common tree around Swartkan. So basically they constructed a campfire and heated in that. So you need something extra together with the information given above to completely support that it shows that they used fire and it was not because of something else. The heated was not because of something else. So let's look at option A. The white stinkwood tree is used for building material by present day inhabitants. Do you think this is relevant? No, no because it talks about present day. It basically does not matter. So let's just write DNM, does not matter. Okay, what about B? Forest fires can heat wood to a range of temperatures that occur in campfires. What do you think this option is doing? Basically saying that forest fires have the same kind of mm -hmm. ability as campfires. Mm 
So basically, they're showing that the argument says the cause of that heating was campfire by, by the hominids. B is giving you an alternative reason. So it is weakening the statement and doing the opposite of what we want. So B is gone. Okay, C, the bone fragments were fitted together by the archaeologists to form complete skeletons of several animals. Does it even matter? No. Yeah, it looks irrelevant. Yes, so, because it doesn't matter whether they were taken separately or together. Apart from this discovery, there is evidence that early hominids used fire as many as 500,000 years ago. So does it really help our case? Well, it's not tying it back to that charred bone fragment. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about one million one, years. One million years. Yeah, and this is just half that time. So it doesn't really help. Now the answer is definitely E, but let's Look at it in detail. The bone fragments were found in several layers of limestone that contained tools known to have been used by early hominids. Now, if you looked at this option without eliminating the others, you probably would have eliminated this because it looks like this limestone and tools, they don't really matter. But think about it. Does it strengthen your argument? Yeah. Yes, because it shows that they also use tools. So, the argument was talking about the heat part of it. This is saying that hominids lived there. Because in the argument, there was nothing about hominids. The hominids were only mentioned in this sentence, in the question itself. The argument was only talking about heat and the campfire. E is the one that's connecting it to the hominids part of the conclusion. So E is going to be the answer. Okay, any, any doubt about this question? No. no. No? Okay. So, okay, this is one that I'll give you to solve. So you have two minutes for this one.
Okay, let's look at the options. Option A, the sole evidence that historians have had that he died no earlier than 1460 was the date of publication. Uh, do you think it matters whether it's true or not? No. No. What about B? Does this person matter? No. 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 Because he could be lying as well. Okay, C. C, Maybe. it's generalizing a bit. It's talking about few writers. So even if few writers did something, that means that there were other writers who did the opposite of that. And we don't know which author belongs in which category. So C doesn't really tell you a lot. Okay, between D and E now. Which one do you think is the answer? Okay. Uh, Lakshmi, what about you? Yeah, I think D. Yes, D is the answer because it supports that uh, this book was actually written in 1409, not in 60, so you should change it from 60 to 9. Now, why E is wrong is it says the testament contains few references to events that occurred later than 1406. So, relevant, I think. Yeah, it's irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't establish anything. So D is the answer. Okay, let's try another question. Okay. Okay, let's go through the options. So, first one, many contagious diseases can be prevented with vaccines. Mm, do you think it's... Uh, yes, I think. Okay. Maybe. Uh, let's keep this, let's not eliminate A. Okay, now B, uh, because of sense, it's talking about money, but the argument talks about time. So B is wrong. C talks about number of students in medical school. That is too general, doesn't make the distinction. D, it talks about accidents versus disease, but it doesn't really say preventable disease or non-preventable disease. So it does not matter. I mean, this does not matter. As population grows, number of doctors has not been keeping pace. It talks about doctors less in number. So yeah, A is fine. Priyanka, did you also get A? Yeah, but I think E could also be it, be the case because um, as the popular, so if it's been cured, 
Mm-hmm. Doctors, so many doctors will not be needed if diseases get cured rather than if they keep spreading. Yeah, you and I had the same doubt. Like, if doctors, you know, when they wouldn't be able to keep pace. Yeah. But then you also have to consider that you need doctors for, uh, like, not not only all doctors will be working for illnesses. There could be other doctors as well. And it does say the population grows, number of doctors has not been keeping pace. So a better idea would be to give probably the ratio of doctors to patients. Is that growing or not? We don't know. So those things make a difference. But A definitely strengthens the argument by showing that you can prevent them with vaccines. So it's better if you invest time in teaching students how to prevent illnesses, for example, through vaccines. Okay. Okay, let's move to the next question. Let's try this one. Two minutes. Okay, let's start with the last option, option E. The year before last movie moon mania experienced 10% increase. So does it really matter what happened three years ago? Because the change happened in canola oil like last year. So the only issue that we have is, is the oil change creating the sales or not, or decreasing the sales. Okay, D, total attendance, at the movie theaters, does it matter? No. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. No, uh, so total attendance. So first thing is something common in option B and D is talking about the ticket sales which are not relevant. So if you have to make a choice between A and C, which one will you choose? C. Okay, Priyanka, what about you? Um, 
for me, I, I, I definitely not C, but I don't agree with A either. Okay. Now, uh, remember there are two arguments happening here. One is the argument that Movie Mania is making that just because we switched to canola oil, uh, it's hurting our popcorn sales. And the second argument, which is the major argument, is being made by this argument on a general level, which is that Movie Mania's argument is wrong because of uh, the 5% more popcorn thing. So the question is, which strongly supports the argument against Movie Mania's claim? Now what C is doing is, Movie Mania's customers prefer popcorn in coconut oil to that of canola oil. This strengthens Movie Mania's uh, argument. But what we want to strengthen is the argument against Movie Mania. So this is being uh, opposite to what we want. And that is why C is wrong. A says total sales of all refreshments increased by less than 5%. Uh, last year, which basically says that although the total sales increased by less than 5%, Movie Mania's popcorn sales actually increased by more than 5%. That means the popcorn sales were not bad if you compare it to what was going on in that particular year. So Movie Mania's argument is wrong. Did you get how A is the answer? yeah yeah it's all about this this part over here less than five percent and uh, five percent more popcorn than last year so popcorn is performing better than the other kind of refreshments lakshmi is it clear why a is the answer yeah yeah okay one last this is the last question for today so you have two minutes So I'll be eliminating a few blatantly wrong options. Okay, so make a choice between D and E. E? E, okay. Uh, Priyanka, what about you? Okay. okay, 
So the argument basically says that these antibodies that we have that uh, have been created for the herpes virus are actually causing, causing the keratitis. He says mice that have never been affected can sometimes develop keratitis. That is actually weakening our argument, showing that there is some other reason out there that can lead to keratitis. So that's why E is wrong. What D says is there are mice that are unable to form antibodies, so they don't have. And these mice, they go through the disease without ever developing keratitis. So if they don't have antibodies, they don't have keratitis, which basically supports our argument and D is the answer. Uh, so Lakshmi, you got E as the answer, right? Did you understand how D? Yes, I got it. I was just looking at the last statement in this. Scientists hypothesize that these causes of keratitis are caused by antibodies. Mm. So, yeah, these antibodies cause the keratitis. So, E is going against that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, that was all for critical reasoning. Uh, let me just go to what we'll be covering next week. Okay. Next week, we have parallelism and comparisons. Uh, just a little heads up on what these are. Parallelism would be when you have a list of items separated by and. All you need to do is make sure that all of them are compatible with each other. Either they're all verbs. If they're all verbs, they should be in the same tense. And usually these are the ones where you have really long sentences. And in critical reasoning, we will be doing assumptions, strengthening, weakening, and evaluate which is a combination of strengthen and weaken. And so obviously it will be using a little bit of assumptions as well. And finally, we'll be doing a few broad questions. So we have a lot to cover. And I'll be adding um, the file on verb errors so you can start practicing them as well. So before I end the class, do you have any questions? No. Uh, no? Okay. All right, then I'm going to end the class and uh, thank you for coming to this one. I'll put the recording online. Thank you. Yeah.